This conference will now be recorded. A yes. <laughs> okay, I'll take that as a yes. Good. So, hello everybody. This is me. I'm I'm Colin Place. I'm principal EMC, principal engineer and head of EMC at Aegis Engineering. Um, I've been for my sins in in UK rail electrical engineering for about 30 years and 24 years of that um, in EMC. Um, even more even more punishment, I'm chair of a Senelec committee which is currently drafting a standard for measurement of EMI from trains. I played um, EMC roles in various high profile projects including in a former life when I worked at um, Bombardier, um, all sorts of different Electra stars going all over the country, AC ones, DC ones, three car ones, four car ones, AC and DC ones. Following on from that, we did Victoria line and subsurface lines for London Underground. And then we progressed to the new platform of Entra, including Crossrail, Low Train, the East Anglia trains that are now entering service. Um, more recently, I've worked on Class 6360 introduction of the Bidman Main Line, Class 484 for the Isle of Wight. Um, in, in cahoots with your speaker next month, Mr. Baker, um, and also Hydroflex and um, Viva Rail's train for the COP26 summit. Okay, so that's enough about me. What about EMC? EMC is electromagnetic compatibility, um, and EMI is electromagnetic interference. Now, more EMC is good. You often hear people saying, oh, there's too much EMC, we've got a problem. No, more EMC is good. What's bad is more EMI. So if there's too much interference, then you might have some kind of electromagnetic problem. Um, and EMC is achieved when um, you, the electrical electronic device, whatever that might be, can function in its intended environment. And now intended is in bold because something that's suitable to have in your living room isn't necessarily suitable to attach to the track of, of your railway, for instance. Um, and not only must that device live in its environment and not fall over due to interference, it shouldn't produce interference itself which interferes with other devices in the environment. OK, and also requiring consideration, but the last time we'll mention it today is something called EMF, electromagnetic fields, which is about human exposure to EMI. So if you like, EMC is a technical compatibility issue, but EMF is about a human health risk. OK, so this is how people typically picture um, an EMC issue. Um, you bought a cheap vacuum cleaner. Um, well, you probably, uh, in this day and age, you've probably bought a very old vacuum cleaner because all modern ones will comply with some some standard or other, and it causes the picture on your telly to go to go fuzzy. I was going to say everybody's seen it. Um, probably in this day and age, it hasn't been seen so much because there are standards that, that limit this kind of thing from happening. And all of this happens because you have a source by the vacuum cleaner, which probably has a brushed motor or something else. Um, and there's a coupling mechanism, which in this case is just the air, um, and a victim which has an antenna um, to receive the interference. OK, and there's various different kinds of, of coupling you could conceive of. So. Um, the one we're going to talk about a lot today is conducted coupling, where you have two circuits that share a common conductor. So at the top, we've got a noise source. At the bottom, we've got a noise victim. And there's a bit of common circuit between them by which noise from the source arrives at the victim. You could also have radiated interference, like our vacuum cleaner. So there's a noise source which has, which has some kind of antenna, which may be completely unintentional. It might just be the way the wires are laid out. And you have a victim which might have a real antenna, like your TV set, or it might have, again, it might just be that it is a particular layout of wires and the field from the source couples into the, the, um, the victim's antenna. Closer up, you could have inductive interference um, where you've got a noise source, which is one circuit, 
and you've got a, a victim which is another circuit nearby and they're coupled together magnetically. Uh, and this is typically an issue for long stretches of railway where you have, for instance, a line side telephone line. So there's a big source of interference, which is the train in combination with the power supply and the great big loop, which is the overhead line and the rails. And then some coupling from that loop into a, another loop, which is the, the telephone wire and its terminations. You can also have capacitive coupling where the noise source has a high voltage and um, through an, an electric field that arrives at the victim, which is nearby. So this is something that might arise um, on the roof of your train where you choose to um, put some electronic device um, which sees noise coming off the 25 kV overhead line, for instance. OK, and why should we bother with EMC? It's also a bit of hassle, isn't it? Why worry about all this? Um, well, first of all, there's a law that says you have to. Um, the EMC regulations, we don't have to worry about the EU anymore, but actually exactly the same words have been transposed into UK legislation. So what used to be the EMC directive is now the EMC regulations. There are potential safety implications. So um, somebody could take you to court because you might cause something like a wrong side failure of a track circuit, which could cause a train collision and kill lots of people. So that's not very good. And there's um, legislation, of course there is, which stops you doing unsafe things. You want to do it for reliability reasons because you don't want the stuff that you fit um, on the railway not to, uh, not to, to work properly. You might do it for compatibility, which is, kind of the safety and the reliability um, all put together and to do with different systems interacting on the railway. And finally, you want to do it early on in the project because you don't want to find you've got an EMC problem at the end. So you get to the end and you drive your train down the railway and all the level crossing lights flash and the CCTV falls over. Um, oh dear, you've got to do something. Wouldn't it been, have been better if you found that out at the beginning? So EMC isn't just a technical issue, it's a process. And here's a few examples of things that have gone wrong, um, some of them railway examples. Um, so as we said, the lack of EMC can lead to unexpected behaviour and the, the resultant issues can ra range in severity from being a little bit irritating, like a bit of fuzz on your telly, to catastrophic. Um, and the amount of work you do is proportional to the consequence and the likelihood of a problem. Um, and some real world problems we have here, um, pendolinos interfering with SSI when they're introduced on the West Coast main line, um, RAF filing dales, radar immobilising cars. Um, there's a place in South London where somebody had a recording studio in an arch and um, Network Rail introduced some new track circuits and they made a horrendous buzzing um, on the recordings in the recording studio. And most recently, there's the um, affair of the Class 800 and various issues that it's had. And most, uh, most serious of these examples was an incident on the USS Forrestal, I think that's the correct pronunciation, where the radar causes a rocket to fire um, into some field tanks and apparently 134 people were killed. So that's an extreme example of what might happen. And there's, if you want to see some more of these, there's um, a little um, reference to the internet there. OK, and just in the illustration, this is the sort of environment you've got on, on the railway. So you just breaking it down a bit. You've got trains driving around connected to electrification systems. You've got passengers on the, that tr those trains with um, pacemakers and mobile phones. Um, you've got electronic equipment on those trains. The trains drive along the track and connect to the track, uh, track circuits and um, axle counters. Um, you've got a substation powering the train with, via a great big loop, which we've already mentioned, which makes a very nice um, inductive transmitter. Um, alongside your 25 kV railway, you might have a 750 volt one, or you might have either by themselves, but each one's got their own problems and they might couple together. And then alongside the track, you might have mobile phone masts or various other radio masts. 
and you might have long telephone wires and other such things. OK, so what about the permanent way? I've waffled on so far and we haven't even mentioned the permanent way, have we? Um, after all, why should we worry about it? It's just a few lumps of concrete, wood and steel. I'm sure you guys would disagree, but um, as an electrical engineer, you might be forgiven for thinking that, mightn't you? So it's, it's not electronic or electrical. It's not an emitter, is it? Because it's not electronic or electrical. It's not a susceptible, a, se a susceptor, because again, it's not got any electronic bits or electrical bits, really, has it? But it's a coupling path. It's a critical coupling path. And the primary issue is that the rails are what we've already mentioned for, um, for conductive coupling. They're a common path for both traction and signaling currents. So there's a potential compatibility issue here due to conductive interference. OK, now just looking at the track, it's, it's, it's lumps of metal, isn't it, and concrete and stuff, but it's, um, it has electrical properties. So rail has a resistance, it's steel, so um, it's got a finite resistance. Uh, nobody's yet come up with a superconducting rail, and I'm not sure we'd want it if, if they had. Um, so the resistance of a rail is about 30 milliohms per kilometre at DC, um, varying depending on the cross section of rail you, you decide to use. Um, and that resistance increases quite dramatically with frequency due to something called skin effect. So as um, you start talking about AC, even though up only as low as 100 hertz, um, the current tends to flow only in the outside of the rail, so the effective resistance of the rail is much higher. Um, and then thinking of the complete track, um, the, rail, uh, the rails together have inductance, so the out and back loop of two rails have an inductance of some millihenries per kilometre um, in the order of one, one and a half to three millihenries, and that's typical. Typically, to get an idea of that, that's equivalent to the sort of input filter you might have on, on a DC train. So it's actually quite a considerable level of, of um, inductance. And of course, there's a, a leakage or conductance, if you like, which you could also call a resistance from rail to rail. And that varies quite dramatically with conditions. Um, so if you're in a, a wet tunnel, it might be almost nothing. Um, and the track circuit engineer, which we'll come to in a minute, might have to put axle counters in instead because they don't work. But if you've got completely dry ballast, you might have hundreds of ohms um, in each kilometre. Um, and that could be increased further by having insulation. There's also a capacitance to the track. Um, and I've seen numbers, huge range, 150 to 3,600 3, microfarads per kilometre. So the track isn't really just two conductors, it's some conductors with um, resistance, with inductance, um, and resistance and capacitance to earth. Okay, and here's some, tra here's some track, um, and we can envisage there's, there's lots of currents flowing in it. You can't see them, so what's going on? Well, here's one thing you might have going on. You might have... Um, overhead line traction so there's current flowing in the traction in the overhead line and that goes back to the substation through the running rails and in this case both running rails are used for the return and we call that double rail traction return more about this later now also the signaling engineer has chosen to connect track circuits to this and there's track circuit current um, flowing out in one rail and back in the other so this is a kind of what an EMC engineer would call um, a common mode and differential mode problem. So you've got a traction current, which is common mode. So the same flowing in both rails and the track circuit current, which is differential mode. So it flies out, out in one rail and back in the other. But there's various possibilities to this. You might just have a single rail return, in which case the traction current only flows in one of the two rails. Hmm, this is all getting a bit interesting, isn't it? How do we separate this? More to come. Or you might have a DC traction system where you have a much bigger current. Um, and again, flowing out in the traction rail, in the, in the third rail, 
and back in the two running rails together, ideally. So here we have double rail traction return. And here we have single rail traction return. Oh, we've got a huge traction current now just flowing in one rail. Hmm. Well, you might do what London Underground do and you could have four rail traction. Now, this sounds great because you completely separate the traction current from the track circuit current. So the current flows out in the outer rail and back in the middle rail. Um, and the track circuit's completely separate because it's in the um, in the running rails. This is, yeah, okay. There's a bit of leakage maybe, but by and large, you've separated the two. This all sounds great until there's an earth fault. Um, and I won't dwell on this any further, but it all gets very, very tricky and makes your headache. Um, certainly it did when we started working on, on the Victoria line because you have to consider all sorts of different scenarios of earth faults because on London Underground, the railway carries, run, carries on running with an earth fault in place. Anyway, enough of that. Um, what, what sort of magnitudes of currents are we talking about for these currents that are flowing about? So in a 25 kV system, you've got hundreds of amps at 50 hertz. Um, in the UK, a typical train, so a 12 car electric multiple unit or a locomotive draws about 300 amps of 50 hertz. And that current will also contain some nice harmonics depending, or nasty harmonics, depending on your point of view. And they will depend on the, um, on the technology used um, in the, in the in the traction system of the train. So up to tens of amps actually, it's um, odd harmonics of 50 hertz, 150 hertz, 250, 350, or even higher frequencies depending on the train technology. On the third rail system, you might have thousands of amps at, at DC. Um, so a typical 12 car train would run at maybe 4,000 amps or something like that and up to tens of amps at 300 hertz multiples, which come from the rectification that goes on in the, in the substations. And an interesting point to note on a DC railway is that the biggest source of interference isn't the trains at all, it's the rectification in the substations. Um, so that's something that you always have to be aware of. Okay, um, the signaling engineer, what's he doing? What, uh, what, what has he, he got, or she, I must be sexist here. Um, depends on the types of track circuits in use, and there are all sorts, um, but generally their currents are much, much lower, milliamps to amps. So the limits for compatibility between the two can be sort of four, four orders of magnitude separated. So um, you've got 4,000 amps of traction current, and your interference limit for a track circuit might be tens of milliamps. So you've got four orders of magnitude between the limit you have to respect and the um, the the current that's been uh, that's being drawn for traction purposes. And the main types of track circuit in UK use, uh, well, we have DC track circuits which are used in AC electrified areas or non-electrified areas, and you wouldn't want them in DC areas because you've got lots of DC traction current flowing in the rails and it wouldn't work. Likewise, 50 Hertz track circuits, which you use on DC traction, you wouldn't want to use those in a 50 Hertz AC electrified area. Um, we also have something called HVI, high voltage impulse, uh, which makes high voltage pulses rather than a fixed frequency. You have some things called reads, which are in the audio band 363 to 43 Hertz something else called FS2600 and um, TI21, EBITRAC200 and EBITRAC400, which are um, similar-ish technology, which work at quite high frequencies from 1500 Hertz upwards. They're the main ones, there are others, but these are the main ones. So these, these frequencies are quite, there's a deliberate frequency separation between the track circuits and the traction current. That's a starter for 10 to get some compatibility going on. Okay, and we can illustrate the principles of how track circuit works. I don't know if you, you know about this, but you're the permanent way institution, not the signaling engineers. So I'll take it that this isn't exactly for grandmothers. Um, so the principle is you have a transmitter at one end of a section and a receiver at the other. The transmitter um, transmits the signal down one rail and receive. Uh, and the return goes down the other, the receiver sees that signal and indicates line clear. So it's fail safe. If the wire falls off the receiver, 
it indicates the lion's occupied. Very sound principle. So his, a train arrives, the current diverts away from the receiver, and the receiver drops or de-energizes, depending what sort of technology it is, and indicates line occupied. Okay, so far so good. We're ignoring any anything coming from the train here. So along comes our train with lots and lots of traction current, and a little tiny bit of it finds its way into the receiver. Oh dear. The receiver thinks, ah, I can see some current. I'm going to close my contacts and indicate that the line's clear. And then bad things happen. Collision or derailment. Best case is um, nothing happens because two trains are not present or the train's not driving over point work. Maybe you get a brief change of aspect. But in the worst case, um, you could conceive of a scenario where a train drove into another train or points drove up, points changed under a train and caused it to derail. Okay, another possible scenario. Um, there's a train somewhere outside this track section, so it's not occupying it, and some of its current finds its way into the receiver such that it cancels out the signal from the transmitter, and it thinks the line's occupied. So, you could, especially with modern track circuits which are coded, you can, you can you can disrupt the code in such a way that the receiver thinks the line's occupied when it isn't, because it fails safe after all. And that's also bad, but not as bad. So delay and disruption. Maybe people have to get out of trains and walk, although that's pretty unlikely. But you don't really want this happening, do you? You don't, you don't want um, signals changing aspect in front of drivers. That's typically the sort of thing that this would cause. So the driver's driving along, quite happily and then all of a sudden the, an aspect changes from green to red in front of him. Not for good for the driver, not good for it, for um, all the investigations that have to take place and the disruption that occurs. So why don't these failures happen all the time? So as we've already alluded to, there's frequency separation of the track circuit and the traction current. There are Modern, in the case of modern trains, they've been designed to standards which say there are very pessimistic interference limits that they've got to comply with. Old trains quite often don't comply with those limits and still everything works, but <clears throat> never mind, let's draw a veil over that for a minute. Um, for modern track circuits like our friend the EBITRAC 400, there's mega complex coding of the track circuit signal, it's got a fail safe design. So wrong side failure is actually more or less impossible. And I saw a proof that said that you wouldn't get one wrong side failure in the life of the universe or something like that. I think it was rather idealistic. But anyway, that, that's the that's the idea. However, it's quite often quite easy to disrupt the code in such a way as to cause a right side failure. So that's it's not a not the uh, the, um, the magic bullet that it at first appears. Um, and also which we're going to come to is the balance of the return path. Um, whether we have double rail or single rail traction, whether we have um, some sort of system to balance the currents in the rails, because this whole business going back to here involves there being a part of the current that goes into the receiver. And if you can make all of the current flow past the receiver and not go into it, then you don't get in any interference. So that's what double rail traction is about. So let's think about how the interference is generated at the track circuit. Here's a single rail track circuit, which is the worst case. So your track, all your traction currents flowing in one rail, and a part of the a voltage is generated across the signal rail by the traction current flowing in the traction current rail. So that rail has resistance, as we've already seen, and inductance, and the flow of that, the current in that rail makes a voltage drop. And if that voltage drop gets big enough, it causes the receiver to indicate that there's no train present when there is. Um, now, this interference voltage is proportional to the rail impedance, obviously. So the longer the track circuit, the worse it is. The smaller the rail cross section, the worse it is. 
if the rail is jointed rather than continuous, so it's got lots of resistance in the joints, it gets worse. And if there, but if there's cross bonding to adjacent tracks, then um, it gets better because you can reduce the impedance of that rail by connecting another rail in parallel with it. What about double rail traction then? Space recognition to unlock the device. Sorry, my phone had just decided it um, wanted to wake up for some unknown reason. Okay, so here we have an ideal situation with double rail track circuit. Um, the, all the current that flows into the track circuit from the, all the traction current flows straight out again, and the track circuit signal flows round completely separately because of something I've called on here the electrical joint. Now there's various details, various different ways of doing this, so don't treat this as absolutely the way all of these systems work, but the electrical joint is there to cause uh, the traction current to be as balanced as possible and the track circuit current to be separated from the traction current and from the, tra the track circuit current in the next track circuit along. So here I've drawn a coupling box that connects across the end of the rail and of the, of, across the rails at the end of the track circuit. There are all sorts of ways of doing this, including impedance bonds or various matching units, Z bonds, various other th things that very clever signaling engineers have dreamt up down the years. And generically, you could refer to those as an electrical joint. So it's some sort of tune zone at the end of the track circuit that makes sure that the traction current flows as far as possible completely balanced and the track circuit current flows round separated from it and separated from the next track circuit. Okay, so there's a, the, the bonding of the track circuits has an absolutely key part in the, um, the, the path between the train and the track circuit. So single rail track circuits, I know they're not ideal, but in some cases you have to have them. So around points and crossings, you've got to have them. Um, and they are the standard way of installing some track circuit types like DC track circuits on the AC railway. Double rail track circuits, um, these are ideally balanced, but they may be unbalanced by um, things like having check rails, like having a third rail, which alters the impedance of um, one, one of the running rails by having broken rails or bonds, so a failure condition, or um, by having some failure condition, which means you have to, for a short term, single rail the track circuit. So single rail a track circuit, which would otherwise be double rail. And the worst case is for susceptibility, as we've already mentioned, the single rail track circuit, which is already 100% unbalanced. Um, and the way, you make sure that doesn't give you too much of a problem is you have a length limitation and cross bonding rules. So usually a single rail track circuit will have quite a significant length restriction compared with a double rail track circuit. Um, and for 50 Hertz that track circuits, that's something like 200 meters compared with two and a half kilometers. Um, and the unbalanced track circuits, we've already, unbalanced double rails already mentioned. OK, so what effects do these bonding limitations have on the limits? So for a 50 hertz track circuit, a single rail track circuit, you're allowed 200 metres. The limit for the train is 1.98 amps, so nearly two amps of 50 hertz the train's allowed to produce before there's a wrong side failure. For a normal double rail track circuit, so by normal we mean a little bit unbalanced, we're not complete idealists, so a bit of, a bit of realism. Um, the limit is, is, four, is four amps, so double the um, single rail track circuit, but that's a track circuit of two and a half kilometres length. So this is the difference in that the bonding gets you. Your, um, a single rail track circuit of 200 metres has a limit of two amps. A double rail track circuit of far longer, two and a half kilometres, has only twice the limit has twice the limit. So it's, it's not a smaller limit, it's double the limit. And then, however, if you then completely unbalance that double rail track circuit, so you single rail it, the limit plummets to 0.24 amps per train. So it's much, much smaller. And this sort of limit is so low 
that no, not only can no train meet it, but other things will mean that the track circuit doesn't work anyway. Okay, so the conclusion. The key role of the permanent way in EMC is as a transfer path between the trains and the track circuits. Different ways of bonding the traction return have a big impact on the susceptibility of the track circuits. So four amps versus two amps for two and a half kilometers versus 200 meters. And it can make the difference between the system working and not working. And the permanent way you'll be pleased to know is not just lumps of concrete, wood and steel. It's got a critical role in EMC. Thank you very much. Hi, Colin. It's Les Fox here. I'm the co-chair of the uh, Cheshire and North Wales section, along with Peter, who did the introduction. Uh, so just before we launch into questions, I'd just like to say thanks for giving us such an interesting talk. It, it's very nice to have um, presentations from people like yourself on slightly unusual subjects like uh, th this one. Um, I must admit, it's, it's, this is a subject area I've always not really understood that well, and I thought your clear slides and uh, diagrams really helped to drive home, you know, help, help people like me understand it, th this subject a little bit better. You know, I, I'm, my background's permanent waste, so I understand lumps of concrete, wood and steel. <laughs> and uh, yes. I've always struggled with, you know, the, the sort of electrical engineering aspects of it particularly. So that was really good. And um, I, I appreciate it does take a lot of time uh, your own time to prepare these these kind of talks because I've done a few myself so I would just like to say we do appreciate it and you know we well the PWI in general we rely on people like yourselves who are willing to give up a bit of spare time uh, for the good of the industry you know sort of spreading knowledge so that's really good um right okay I'll ju just go into the questions if that's okay I think we've got one in the chat if I have a look uh, oh no, we haven't. <laughs> I can't see any in the chat box at the moment. Anyway, I don't know. Has anybody got any questions for Colin? If you want to speak up or type something in the chat box, I'm, I'm happy to read it out. No, a anybody? Any questions? I, I'll, I'll go with it, Les. It's Roy. Oh, hi, Roy. So, hi. So that that was what what you showed us there, Colin, was a track circuited route, yeah. Yep. So so what happens on an axle counter route? Oh, on an axle counter route, um, well, you don't have track circuits, so you're you're not so worried about um, this sort of issue. Um, the axle counters um, are just are bolted onto the rail, and they don't care that much about the um, the bonding arrangement um, that axle counters work at a much higher frequency so they're uh, if track circuits working in the tens and hundreds of hertz and axle counters working in tens of kilohertz so 10,000 hertz 20,000 hertz or Frauscher one works at a megahertz so a million hertz okay so you the uh, the level of current that the train produces is not very much at those frequencies and it's far less important about the bonding and in fact the effect of that the train has on it is much more of a local one so it doesn't normally cause an issue unless it's standing over the top of it um, and the sort of issue you often get is that current is flowing underneath the train from one part of the train to another and that flow it goes past the axle counter head and causes some disruption of the magnetic field um, I have seen this a few times, but it's quite a well-known phenomenon and the traction engineers know how to control it. And it's irrelevant what the bonding is because at the time it's happening, the train's standing on top of the device and the train's shunting the rails together. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, so, so basically the, the, uh, an axle counter route is, is less susceptible to EMC. Yes, yes it okay. is. Yes, or yes, it has an entirely different susceptibility and it's it's something you don't worry about in terms of bonding, certainly. It's much more in control of the train as well. Fantastic. Thanks, Colin. Okay. Okay. Uh, any more questions for Colin? 
Hi, one for, one for me. Um, Les, it's Lynn here. Um, I was just wondering about regenerative bacon. Does that have any effect or impact on EMC? Um, if, if the train's designed reasonably, then it will behave more or less the same when it's regenerating as when it's motoring. Uh, that's that's normally the case that they all the all the converters that are doing their switching they're still switching in the same way it's just the fundamental current if you like that's going in the opposite direction um and uh, it may sound like voodoo and witchcraft and and actually it is <laughs> but um that what they uh, all you're doing is changing um I'm trying to think of a simple way of explaining it. You can change the direction that the power flows in without by switching different devices, but in the same way. So what the the interference that the, that is seen outside the train is very, very similar, whether the train's regenerating or motoring. What you what does cause a difference often is if you have rheostatic braking, because when you start rheostatic braking, you have something called a brake chopper, which is a sort of different converter. So this train starts producing a different sort of interference while it's rheostatic braking. So actually, while people have been panicking about regenerative braking all these years, I think the real issue is making sure that the rheostatic braking isn't an issue. Does that answer your question? Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to hog the questions, but I was just wondering about yeah. stuff that we um, we bolt onto the track either on and off throughout the year or permanently, you know, stuff like point heating equipment or even stuff like hot, hot axle box detectors or gotchas and stuff like that. So that trackside furniture do anything? Um, we don't normally worry about it. it I, th I think it has to be reasonably robust because it's attached to the track, but it's insulated from the track normally, isn't it? The heaters and things, they, they don't form part of the traction path. So uh, uh, a points heater, in my understanding, is, an, is, is insulated from the rail. It's a heating element, but it isn't actually part of the same circuit. So it's fed from its own separate circuit. And it's a, it's a DC, circuit or 50 hertz circuit um, and it's not susceptible in the same way that a track circuit is and i think the same goes for other sorts of things that you you bolt to the rail is that all right yeah 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 perfect thank you okay can i jump in with a quick question colin yeah uh, i've been involved in quite a few of the northwest train care depots over the last few years and i remember the EMC aspects, EMC and bonding for, for those. Yeah. There, there were requirements for a double IRJ arrangement on the approach to the fueling roads. When I say double IRJ, I mean in, in the same rail, IRJ yeah. followed by IRJ, which is a bit unusual. I never really fully understood why that was necessary. Um, that's probably um, to separate the earth on that bit of track from the uh, from the traction earth um because the rails are a carrier of current locally they can be at a higher voltage than the surrounding earth if you see what right. i mean because mm. the current is flowing out of the train back to the substation and it causes a volt drop down the rails and that volt drop can be can be too high for health and safety if you're within a depot environment so what they the reason for doing this might be that they want to keep um, the rails locally in the depot bolted down firmly to the local earth and they and by having a double IRJ they avoid the train short circuiting those rails to the rest of the railway right I have have heard of such things in other places mm. right thanks yeah uh, does does anybody else have any more questions for Colin before we wrap up yeah, I dashed through it, I'm afraid, but, um, you know, That's I mean, fine. And all that. OK, it Do doesn't look like we've got any more questions, Colin. I, I will just add before we finish, um, if anybody wants to see the presentation again or, or look through it at their leisure, these generally do get posted by the PWI on YouTube. So um, it's worth looking out for, probably gets okay. posted in, in, in a week or so, uh, as, as long as Colin is happy for that to happen, obviously. 
Um, I'll be a YouTube star, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll just finally say as well, for, for anybody um, in the audience, particularly those that are aspiring to for professional registration in the near future, don't forget to book your CPD for these meetings. Uh, I think the default is an hour and a half uh, you get for these, so don't forget to do that. And um, I think that just leaves me to say, uh, well, ask the audience if you could just briefly unmute your microphones and give Colin a quick round of applause to show our appreciation. I think that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, you're welcome. Cheers, Colin. Thanks, Colin. Cheers. And Thanks, Colin. I think